Hello and welcome to the God's Words Bible Study and as usual we'll start with a word of prayer. Our Father and our God, we thank you Lord for this opportunity to look into your word and we pray Lord that you will send the Holy Spirit to tabernacle with us and to teach us. In the holy name of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior, we pray. Amen. And today we're starting a new study on the book of Jude. And as you know, Jude only has one chapter. And so what we're going to be doing as usual is that we're going to be doing an expositional Bible study, meaning that we're going chapter by chapter, verse by verse, word by word. And this is the way that you should read the Bible. This is the way that you should study the Bible is chapter by chapter, verse by verse, word by word. And so let's start. Today we'll start by reading Jude chapter 1 verses 1 and 2. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. Mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. Amen, amen. And so, for verse 1, there are six things that we need to cover. And the six things are separated by commas in this first verse. And they are Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ, brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father, preserved in Christ Jesus, and called. And so let's start with Jude, the author of this book. Who was Jude? The brother of James and Jesus Christ. The brother of James and Jesus Christ. Now, I wouldn't say that Jude was the half-brother of Jesus Christ, as most people would say. And this is why. Because when I say that Jude was the half-brother of Jesus, I mean something completely different from what most churches and certainly the Catholics mean when they say that Jude was the half-brother of Jesus Christ. When I say that Jude was the half-brother of Jesus Christ, what I mean is that Jude had the same mother, but a different father from Jesus. Because Jude's father was Joseph, and Jesus' father was God. God. When the Catholic and most churches, most denominations say that he was a half-brother of Jesus Christ, what they mean is that Mary is not Jude's mother. That Jude and the rest of his brothers, except for Jesus Christ, were born to Joseph's first wife. And I'm going to tell you right now that that is absolute rubbish. Okay? Jesus was the firstborn of both Mary and Joseph. Now, Mark, you, he was adopted by Joseph as a son because, as we said before, his real father was God. The reason why they insist that he was a half-brother is because they're trying to preserve the virginity of Mary. And even today, the Catholics will insist that Mary remained a virgin until her death. Well, the Bible tells us that this is not so because it tells us that Joseph didn't know her not in, hey, how are you? I'm Joseph, you're married. Not like that, not an introduction, but they didn't know her sexually until... After she gave birth. After Jesus was born, that's right. Which in itself means that she did not remain a virgin because he knew her after Jesus. Was right, born. and she had many children, Jesus' brothers and sisters, of which Jude is one, and as you said before, James is another. The reason why they try to preserve the virginity of Mary is because, first of all, the Mary in the Catholic Church, the Virgin Mary, is not the Mary in the Bible. That Mary is coming from a long line of goddesses, such as Nimrod's wife, the mother of Tumas, commemorated in the Easter holiday, Diana, Astoreth, and all these multiplicity of goddesses, which is the same goddess, actually. And so, this is who this Virgin Mary in the Catholic Church is. Now, when we think about that Mary in conjunction with the Immaculate Conception, a lot of good Christian people think that the Immaculate Conception had to do with the birth of Jesus Christ. No, it doesn't. The Immaculate Conception is the belief that the Virgin Mary was free of original sin from the moment of her conception. And so, that is why... 
they will always point out that Jude and James were the half-brother of Jesus Christ, meaning that they were not Mary's children because Mary had no children because she remained a virgin until her death. Okay, so I just want to point that out. So Jude is Jesus' younger brother. And if this is true, why does the second point that we're going to look at says that he is the servant of Jesus Christ? They didn't say that he was the brother of Jesus. He said he was the servant of Jesus. And the word servant here is, of course, doulos, which means a slave. Well, it shows that he has accepted Jesus as his Lord. Exactly. Because once he came to a realization of who Jesus was, who Jesus is, he no longer identified him as strongly as a brother as he did as master. The second reason why he's doing this is because you will see, for example, the Bible tells us that Jesus did not baptize. Later on, Paul said that he was not sent to baptize and he only baptized a few people. Here's what's happening with this now. We like to pick sides and draw ranks. And so if someone came along and said that they were baptized by Jesus, then right away we think that they're more chosen, they're higher in their Christian walk than someone who was baptized by Paul or who was baptized by Peter. Which is why if you remember when Paul spoke about this, Paul says that, why are you talking about I'm of Cephas and I'm of Paul and I'm of Apollos? Did any of us die for you? And so it is important what he's doing here. He is disassociating as Jesus with his brother because that is not his claim to fame right now. His claim to fame is not biological, it's spiritual. Okay? So he is the servant of Jesus Christ, the slave of Jesus Christ, and he is the brother of James. Now what James is this? Is this James the brother of John, those rambunctious peer called the sons of thunder? No. No. At this point, John's brother James is already dead. He was the first disciple to be martyred and he was killed. He was beheaded by King Herod. Sometime after that, James, the brother of Jesus, rose to prominence in the church in Jerusalem and he's widely regarded as being the leader there. And in fact, when Paul went there during the dispute about whether or not the Gentiles should be circumcised, James, the brother of Jesus, not James the disciple, was the one who presided over that meeting. And so he's saying that he is the brother of that James the one who presided over the church at Jerusalem. Okay? Turn to our fourth point. To them that are sanctified by God the Father. And if you have been listening to our Bible study, you know that this is one of my pet peeves, that I'm always telling you that sanctification is not the work of a lifetime. Your sanctification and my sanctification has nothing to do with our effort. We are sanctified the moment that God chose us. Sanctification, as my wife just indicates, means to be set apart for holy use by God. And so let us quickly look at what sanctification is. And for that, let's go to Romans chapter 15, 15 and 16. Nevertheless, brethren, I have written the more boldly unto you in some sort as putting you in mind because of the grace that is given to me of God, that I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God, that the offering of the Gentiles might be acceptable, being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. So Paul is here saying that the offering of the Gentiles, you and I, are sanctified by the Holy Ghost. You see that? Mm -hmm. Now let's jump down to Hebrews chapter 10 verse 14, and it says... For by one offering he has perfected forever them that are sanctified. So who is it that has perfected this sanctifying offering? To find the answer for that, let's go up a couple of verses to verses 9 and 10. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he might establish the second. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Hold on. He says here in verse 9, 
Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. This is Jesus speaking to God. And in verse 10, he said, by the which will, the will in verse 9 that he has come to do, O God. You see that? By the which will we are sanctified. sanctified. So how are we sanctified? By Jesus Christ. We are sanctified by the will of God through the offering of Jesus Christ. You see that? Okay, so where in this do you see anything that would indicate that sanctification is a work of a lifetime? And I challenge you, you can do a little Google search, you can use your phone and just put in sanctification, sanctify, whatever, and go through and look and see how this word is used in the entire Bible, both Old and New Testament, and you will find that it has nothing to do with work. The closest it comes to telling us that we have to do something, it says that when God sanctifies us, we sanctify ourselves. Remember that? And I explained that what that looks like in practical terms in our everyday life is when a man proposes to a woman. When he goes down on his knee and he said, will you marry me? He is sanctifying her. He is separating her from the other 4 billion women in this world. To himself. To himself. And when she says, I will, she sanctifies herself to him. Okay? It's the exact same thing that is happening. This is why we always compare Christianity to a marriage. Because that's exactly what it is. Verse 10 in the New Living Translation, it says, for God's will was for us to be made holy by the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all time. Amen. Amen. Oh, and by the way, I just want to emphasize before we leave this, that we are sanctified by God the Father through Jesus Christ. Right. Okay? And we can even go a little bit further and say, by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Okay. All right? So let's go on to the next section in our verse, and it says, preserved in Jesus Christ. Now, what does it mean, preserved? Kind of relates to what you just said. Jesus said that he's the gate through which we enter into eternal life, through which we come to the Father. And he says for us to abide in him. All of this is indicative of us being preserved in him. Amen, amen. Very good. So what does preserve mean? To keep. To keep, to guard. All right? And so, to get a little more light on this, let's go to Isaiah 26, verse 3. And we will see how it is that God keeps us, preserve us in Christ Jesus. Thou will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. So how does God keep you? In peace. He keep you in peace when? When you're in Christ. Stick into the verse, stick into Isaiah 26, verse 3. When you trust in him. When you trust in him, when your mind is stayed on him. Now, once you see this, that God will keep you in perfect peace, when your mind is stayed on him, when you trust in him, it should immediately remind you of Proverbs 4, verse 23, which says, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Keep thy heart with all diligence. diligence, because out of it are all the issues of life. What it is saying is that you have to guard the avenues of your soul. You have to make sure that you abide in Jesus Christ, that you abide in God, so that you are not distracted, so that you are not drawn away. And when you do this, when your mind is one with God, God will keep you in perfect peace. You will never know peace as long as you are 50% Christian, 75% Christian, 90% Christian, 99% Christian. She's you not will Christian at all. Exactly. You will never know peace because you will always be tithering between two masters, which is why God says that he doesn't delight in an unstable soul. We have to make up our mind, pick a side, and stick with that side. A double-minded. Unless, of course, you made the wrong choice, then God willing, you'll have time to change and to come back to God. And you said that the verse that I was referring to is? 
James 1 8. A double minded man is unstable in all his ways. And so we are preserved in Jesus Christ. So all we have to do, folks, it, Christianity is very, very simple. All we have to do is stick with God and leave all the problems to Him. Charles Sanger always tells us to obey God and leave all the consequences to Him. And when we do that, we will be preserved in Christ Jesus. Because, folks, you don't know how good your God is. Most Christians have no clue on how good God is. If we follow God, God will take care of us. If we put him first, he will put us first. Okay? All right. Let's move on to the last part of this verse. And it says, preserved in Christ Jesus and called. Now, what does it mean called? Because we must remember that many are called, but few are chosen. Jesus actually used this phrase in two of his parables. Many are called, but few are chosen. In Matthew 20 verse 16, he uses this phrase. And if you remember, this is the story about the reapers. Remember the master went out at 6 o'clock, at 9 o'clock, at 12 o'clock, at 3 o'clock, and at 5 o'clock. And he brought these guys in to work the field. And he said at that time, many are called, but few are chosen. And later on, in Matthew, two chapters later, in Matthew chapter 22, verse 14, he again uses this phrase. And this time he was talking about the wedding feast on how the master invited all his friends to come to his son's wedding. And they found excuses and didn't go. And so he sent the servant out and he says, go into the highways and byway. Compel anyone who you see to come so that my house will be full, so that we will have a nice big grand wedding. And both these times, Jesus says, many are called, but few are chosen. Because when Jude says here, and called, that Jude is called, he is not talking about this general calling, this general invitation. When you read the Bible, those who are called are actually those who are chosen. answer the call. Right, right. There are two responses that you can make to the call of God on your life. It's not that you were calling, you said no, or you were calling, you said yes. God calls you, and if you answer the call, if you say yes, then you have answered the call, and now you're one of the called. If God calls you, and you reject him, if you say no, you have rejected the call, and you're not one of the called. Right. You see that? So whenever you see this word in the Bible, those who are called... It's specifically speaking about those who are saved, those who say yes to God, not the general masses. God comes along and there's a million people and he calls every single one of them because God says that it is not his will that any should perish, but that all should be saved. If only one person answer that call, then only that person is called. The rest of them were not called. You see it? It's, so it's an effectual thing. Exactly, exactly. And so James says that he was called. And so let's go to Second Timothy chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the affliction of the gospel according to the power of God, who hath saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. When God called us, he didn't call us based on what we did, what we were doing, or what we would do. What he called us by is grace. He called us of his own purpose and of his own grace. He didn't need any qualifications from us. The only thing that he needed from us was a yes. A willingness. A willingness to follow him. So this is why, folks, when we look at it, we have to understand that when we are called, one, we have nothing to boast about. But two, we have everything to boast about in Christ Jesus. Because he is our boast. He is our pride and joy. He is our all in all. He is our everything. Because when he called me, I did not deserve it. And 20 years after I've been working in the vineyard for him, 
day after day after day, I still am not deserving of it because the Bible has told me that eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, neither has it entered into the imagination of men those things that he has prepared for those who love him. And folks, let me just change that at the back. For those he loved. Because we love him because he first loved us. That's the end of Jude chapter 1 verse 1. And so let's go to verse 2 which says, Mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. And folks, this is just a general greeting. This is like hello in a letter. Or dear at the start of a letter. This is just a salutation. And to see this, let's go to 2 John 1 verse 3. Grace be with you, mercy and peace from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. Amen, amen. And so you see, that's how they used to greet each other. Whenever you see someone, you would tell them, Grace and peace be unto you, or mercy and peace be unto you. Or as Christ instructed the disciples, whenever you enter into a house, let your peace come upon it. Okay? And so we are always wishing for those around you. You are always extending the grace and the peace of God to all that comes within your circle. But he says one thing here that is a little extra, didn't he? He says all of these things. Mercy, peace, and love be multiplied. When I see that, my heart flutters because I know exactly what he's saying. The peace, mercy, and love of God in your life is everything that you could ever want. But we always want it to be multiplied. As Luke chapter 6 verse 38 says, Give and it shall be given unto you good measure, pressed down and shaken together and running over. This is how God wants to give us these virtues, these circumstances in our life. Peace and mercy and grace and truth and love. He wants it to come upon us in abundance. And whenever I see this verse, it always just draw me to Malachi 3 verse 10 where it says, Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me wherewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there will not be room enough to receive it. When I say that there will be not a room enough to receive it, what God is saying here is that when he blesses you, you won't be able to accommodate it, to absorb all of this into your life. And this is why as Christians, we have to learn to share. It's running over. It's yeah, because as the song say, it's running over, it's running over. And we have to find someone to share it with. This is why we evangelize. This is why we tell people about the love of God. This is why we tell people about the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, is that the love in my heart is just a running over. That is what God is doing to us. That is how God is blessing us, so that there is copious blessings in our lives that we can't keep our mouth shut. We have to tell someone where the water is. So in conclusion to today's lesson and to this copious blessing that God gives to us, I just want to remind you of the blessing that God gave to Israel when they came across the Jordan River. And as he passed through, he pronounced a blessing on them. And I just want to read the first six verses of that blessing for you so that this will become true in your life. Now listen to this. And this is in Deuteronomy 28 verses 1 through 6. And it says, and it shall come to pass, if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe and to do all his commandments which I have commanded thee this day, that the Lord will set thee on high above all the nations of the earth. And all these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee, if thou shalt diligently hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. Blessed shalt thou be in the city, and blessed shalt thou be in the field, Blessed shall be the fruit of thy body, and the fruit of thy ground, and the fruit of thy cattle, the increase of thy kind, and the flock of thy sheep. Blessed shall be thy basket and thy store. Blessed shall thou be when thou comest in, and blessed shall thou be when thou goest out. Folks, what God is saying is just going to bless you no matter which way you turn. And I love this part in verse 2 where it says, 
and all these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee. Folks, when you have God in your life, you are so blessed that you can't escape it. No matter what you do, no matter what you put your hand to, God said he will make it prosper. And this is what Jude is saying here. Mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. And folks, this is what I wish for you today. May your life be a picture of mercy and grace and truth and love. And may these things be multiplied in your life and in the life of everyone that you touch. One pastor said that God only works in multiplication, not addition, subtraction. Well, that is true because all his blessings are exponential. And so, folks, with that, may God bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. Until we meet again, walk with the King and be a blessing. Goodbye. <laughs>